Forms, forms, forms. Whether you love them or hate them, they are everywhere. And if you ask me, then I think mastering forms is one of the most essential skills that a web developer can have. Because the problem is, to be honest, most of the web developers that I see on a daily basis can't create good forms. They don't look good, they are not accessible, they are not technically viable, they don't work as they should. But after this video right here, this will change. You will learn how to create good forms which work as they should. And now without any further talking, let's check out what you're going to build in this video. So on my screen, you currently see a form or let me correct myself. These are two forms in one. I hope this makes sense. So we have right here two tabs and I can select between a talk to sales form and a support ticket form, but we'll come to that in a second. The first thing you should see right here is that this is styled beautifully. That's because we use Shadsian UI with Tailwind CSS and Shadsian UI is a component library which is styled and accessible at the same time. It's very easy to customize and it's my favorite library on the market. And as I also mentioned a second ago, this library is accessible which means that this form right here is also accessible. And to show you the accessibility, I will now click on the tab on my keyboard and now you can see I can select the two forms just with the keyboard no mouse, no nothing, just the keyboard. And of course, also all of this is built on Next.js, the best framework on the market. But let's try to submit this form right here. Whoa, we got right here a few errors. Why do we have errors? Well, it's quite simple. We right here have client-side validation, plus server-side validation. For this, we use conform plus Zot. Zot is a TypeScript schema validation library and conform is a form library. This means using Zot and conform, we can take the both together and we can create a great experience both on the server side and also on the client side. This also means that our form is completely secure and that's exactly what you want. But since we are already talking about security, I think I should also mention that I have implemented a honeypot input. This means if a spam bot tries to write here submit this form, we will know that and we won't allow this bot to submit this form. But now since we all know that, let me try to submit this form. So let's say Jan Marshall, let me give it a email. Let's say, hey, how are you? And let me right here submit it. So let's click enter. We have a beautiful loading state and we got redirected to our success route. This is completely headless. So we built the success route by ourselves. You can customize it as you want, which is very, very cool. Now there are two things which I want to right here explicitly mention. First of all, as you saw, our button had a beautiful loading state, but also on my phone, I just got a notification that our form has been submitted. This form submission is made possible thanks to get form who is also sponsoring this video. GetForm provides a headless form API that handles submissions, security and notifications without needing to create our own backend. I have been personally using GetForm already for about four years and this is one of the most essential services that I use in all of my applications. And the cool thing is that it handles automatically our submissions, it prevents spam and it centralizes everything in a beautiful dashboard. To show it to you right here we have our two forms so I will zoom in a bit and you see all of the submissions right here. So we have nine submissions for our talk to sales form and we have right here two submissions for our support ticket. Also what you see is that I right here get an email from GetForm that tells me that I have a new submission on my form. So right here it's the talk to sales form. We have the name, we have the email and the message of the user who submitted the form. But that's not all. What we also have is an email for the user who submitted the form. In this email, we just say, hey, thank you for submitting the form. We will come back to you in a couple of days. And this shows you the need for get form and why it saves so much time. But wait, we are still not done. There's still a cool thing. If you now go to our second form, you right here see that we can upload assets. So images or documents, whatever you need. So let me right here submit all of my data. All right, I have now filled out everything and I've also right here uploaded a image. And if I now click on submit, we have again a loading state and we have right here a success 
redirect. What you'll now see is if I go right here to the dashboard from get form for our support ticket, you will right here see the name, you will see the email, you will see the message, the date, and then also the asset right here. I can download it and then it will download right here. And also again, I get this notification right here on my phone. So yes, everyone, this is what we are going to build in about two hours or so, a complete form tutorial where we are going to build two forms, which are completely functional, accessible, secure. They look very, very nice. And again, asset uploading and also this whole headless form API works as it should, which is very, very cool. In my opinion, this is probably the best tutorial right here on the internet on YouTube. So if you're now ready to become a 10 times better web developer, well, then sit back again, get some water. Hydration is very important. And now with all of that out of the way, let's go. All right, friends. So we're now in my screen, on my screen, at my screen, or at least you should now see my screen. So currently I'm in the terminal and what I want to do first of all is install a new Next.js project. So let me right here cd into my desktop directory. Let me cd into my YouTube directory. And inside of here, let me do a npx create dash next dash app at latest. Now with this at latest, I just install the newest and also the most stable version of Next.js. Then for the name, I will just say form dash Next.js. Let's click on enter. Then we will use TypeScript, we will use ESLint, we will use Tailwind, we won't use the source directory, we will use the app router, and we won't customize the default import alias. So as you see, I've selected all of the defaults, that's what I recommend, and that's what you should also do. So this installation will now take a minute or two, and once it's done, I will come back. All right, as you now see, Next.js has been fully installed, or in other words, everything has been set up. So what you can do now is go to your Visual Studio code or your cursor or whatever code editor you like. And as you already also see right here, I've already opened the project. To do the same, go to the top on file and then on new or open folder. So inside of here, let me first of all go really quickly inside of the package.json to see what we have. So right here you see we have a right here React version of 18, we have a Next.js version of 14, but this project is completely compatible with Next.js 15, so the release candidate. I tested out everything, it works with TurboPack, with Next.js 15, with React 19, it works. The only problem is that the installation is a bit, let's say, funny, because when you install Shats in UI or um, our server validation library, you have to do a dash dash force because the peer dependencies haven't been yet updated because again, Next.js 15 and React 19 are not fully deployed or not fully released right now, which means they are still like in a beta state if you want to call it like that. So officially it's a release candidate, but for now I will call it better. So again, right here I use Next.js 14, but if you want to use Next.js 15, it does not make any difference to be honest. So since we are now done with that, we can now get started. You should all know right here this code structure. I don't really think I have to go inside of here, but let's first of all go in the app folder. Let's go in the page TSX. You right here see all of these default things. We don't really need that. So for now, let me first of all open the terminal to see how our website and in that sense, our dev server looks like. So let me right here do a npm run dev. This will start our dev server on localhost 3000. And then let me open that in Chrome. All right, friends, so the dev server has started and this is what you have right here. So again, that's our default page.tsx. This is not what we need. We want to start or we want to create our own form component. So what we can do for now is delete everything in the return statement. Let me just delete everything. Let me zoom in a, a bit more. And inside of here, for now, we can just return a diff element, h1, and I can just say hello from Next.js. If I now save that and again go back, you see now right here on the top, hello from Next.js, and that looks good. So what we can do now is install Shats in UI, our component library, to make our form look beautiful. And then we can st get started with everything, the form submission, our headless form API from GetForm. We can create our client and server-side validation, our loading state, everything like that. So for now, again, let me go to ui.chatsian.com. And if you don't know what Chatsian UI is, it's quite simply a component library. It's built on Redix UI. So if you have never heard about Redix UI, Redix UI is a component library, which is not styled, but completely accessible, which is great. 
and Shad UI takes these accessible components, so right here, and builds on top of them. So at the end of the day, we have accessible components, which are also styled beautifully. And the nice thing also is that you can really easily customize them and do whatever you want with them. One big problem that I had with, for example, Material UI in the past was that they were accessible, they were styled quite good, but you couldn't really customize them and modify them. With Shadscene UI, it's different, it's very easy, it's very easy to customize, and that's what I like. So what you have to do first of all is right here go to the documentation, so to the docs, and then right here we now have the installation tab. So what framework do we use? We use Next.js, who would have thought? So let me go to Next.js and what I want to do right here is copy this installation command. So this is the CLI npx shard cn init. So let's copy this right here. I use npm. Let's go back to VS Code. I will stop my dev server. Let me clear everything and then let me just paste it inside of here. As you will now see, um, the CLI right here will do everything for us. Or first of all, I have to install the newest version because there is a new version, which is always quite cool. And inside of here, it will now ask us in a second a few questions. So as you see, what style would we like to use? Well, I think the New York style is fine enough for us. Then for the base color, let's choose neutral. And for CSS variables, yes, let's use that. That's always good. So as you now see, it's installing right here dependencies. It's updating our globals.css file, our Tailwind file, and now it's done. So if you wonder what right here Shadzian has done right now, we can go right here to the Explorer and inside of here, you will first of all see we have a new components.json file. This is like a configuration file for Shadzian. So as you see right here, um, we have, for example, the schema, then we say, hey, we use React server components because we use the app router. Then we tell them uh, this file right here where our Tamen config uh, file lives, where our globals file lives, where our base uh, or what our base colors and everything like that. So it's like a configuration file. Then if you continue and go to the globals.css file, you see it has also updated because we now right here have CSS variables. These are used for in UI. So with that, we will style, for example, the card component or the button component. So it's very essential. And the nice thing is that it's right here CSS variables, which means it's very easy to update the theme. So if you go to in UI and go to the themes, you right here see you can select any theme that you like. So right here, for example, this blue color, or you can use a green color. And this uh, default right here is like this sync color, so this black and white. So it's fine, but later on we will customize that. But for now, let's just leave it as it is. So we have now talked about that. And what you'll also see right here is if you go to the package.json file, you will see we have installed a few dependencies. So right here in the dependencies, we now, for example, have CLSX, we have class variance authority, we have Lucid React. Lucid React is a icon library. It's in my opinion, the best icon library on the internet. It's completely free. So you can just copy this URL. We can go to Chrome and just open that if you have never seen it. And I also use it in my personal projects. It's easy to use, it's easy to style, and that's very cool. Then you also see we install Tailwind Merge, Tailwind CSS Animate. This is again for shads in UI to make everything look nice. We also have a few dev dependencies. This means these dependencies don't show up in your production bundle size, but yeah, I don't really think we need that. So now we have talked about everything, which means we can now get started using shards in UI. Who would have thought? So the first thing I want to do right now is first of all, create the UI. Once we have created the UI, we will create first of all, our integration with GetForm to make the form submission work. And after that, I will show you how to do all of the validation. So that's our process. So let's first of all, start with the UI as already said. And for that, what we'll first of all do is delete this div element and I want to start off fresh. So we'll start right here with a section element. And then for the section, let me first of all start with a class name or I want to style that. 
So let me give it a class name and let's say minimum height of screen. This means the minimum height is 100 viewport height, so 100% of the screen. And let's also do right here width of screen, so also width of 100%. And then the styling right here is very simple. I want to say flex, then flex of column, items of center, and justify of center. What do I do right here? Well, I take the children and I just style them or I put them in the middle of the screen. So we take or we say, hey, let's use the full height, let's use the full width, and let's take the children and let's put them just right here in the middle. So not on top, not on the left, nowhere, right here in the middle. So now we have done that. What we can do also right here is give it a bit of padding on the X side. So let me right here just say padding X of five, so padding on the horizontal side. And inside of here, let me render an H1. And what we'll say is very simple. We will just say contact us. Then let me save that. And if we again go back, let me go to my website. You see nothing has updated and that's because our dev server is not running. And before we start our dev server, let me actually, first of all, install a few components from Shadzin UI, which we'll need for this project. So let's go to Shadzin UI. The first thing we will need is the button component for our submit button. And this is how it looks like. It's very simple, it's accessible. You can also see right here, this is the primary color, this is the secondary color, then we have a ghost color, everything like that. This looks beautiful. So what we'll do right here is copy this installation command. So again, this is the CLI. Let me just copy this. Let's use NPM, let's go back, let's open the terminal. Let me right here just clear everything in the terminal. And then let's just paste it inside of here. So now we will install the button right here. Then let's continue. What else do we need? I want to use the card component. So this is how the card component will look like. Inside of the card, we will render the form with the input, the text area, the labels, and everything like that. So let me again copy right here the installation command. Let me again use npm. Let's go back and let's paste it inside of here. Then the next component, which I want to use, is right here the tabs component. And the tabs component right here will be rendered at the top because again, at the end of the day, I want to have like two, could you say two contact sections? So one section will be for talk to sales and one will be there to uh, create a support ticket. So we'll have like two forms in one, very cool. So let me right here install the tabs. Let's again use right here NPM. Let's go back to the terminal and let me paste that inside of here. Then what else do we need? We need the label component. So the label is what will be rendered above the input. So for example, we will have a input for the name and on top of this input, we'll just have a label which will say name so that the user knows what to input inside of this input. I hope this makes sense. So let me go right here to the installation command. Let me copy that. Let's use NPM. PM, and let me again paste it in the terminal. Then what we also need is the input itself because the user has to do a input. This is the styled input. It looks very nice. So let me right here copy the installation command. Let's again use npm and let me paste it inside of here. Also one thing which I haven't mentioned, if you use bun or pnpm, then of course just copy the correct copy or the correct right here version. I use npm. That's why I also copy npm. Then, okay, we have now the input and the last thing which we need is the text area itself. So let's use this right here. This is the text area. Again, it looks very simple. Nevertheless, it's great because it's completely accessible. And inside of here, let me now copy the installation command using NPM. Let's open our again terminal and let's paste it inside of here. So in theory, this should now be all if I haven't forgotten anything. So we have the button, we have the input, we have the text area, we have the label, we have the card, we have the tabs. I think this should be everything. Maybe not, but I think it's all. So since all of this has been installed, we can now clear the terminal and we can again restart our dev server with npm one dev. Also one thing, if you want to save time, you can also open a second terminal tab and install everything inside of there. The reason why I stopped my dev server is because Next.js sometimes has a bit of bundling problems and then there are some problems. So that's why I personally always restart the dev server because this just gives me 100% security that everything is running as it should. And right here, I can now again go back to my website and restart that. 
All right, friends, the dev server has again restarted. And one thing you should do right now is drink some water. It's very important. You want to stay hydrated. But now let me continue. So we now have this contact us uh, text, this H1. Does it look good? Mm, I don't think so. I think it could look a bit better. So let me again go back. And also one thing you should know is that it's now centered, which is cool. But now let's make it a bit bigger because it's currently not big enough. So for this H1, let me give it a class name and let me say text of 4XL and then let's say font of bold. And let me also say for now nothing. Let's save that. Let's again go back. And now you see it's bigger. And I think this looks quite good. Okay, then what else do we need? We have now the H1 and now I think we can get started with rendering our card component. So let me right here get our card. This is imported from our components. Let's open that and then right here for this card, let me also give it a class name. So I want to give it a max width. I don't want to take or I don't want to allow the card to take the full width. I only want to allow the card to take a certain width. So let's write here get a class name and let's say max width of custom value. And then for that, let's say 500 pixels. Let me also say W of full. And now this looks good. Then inside of the card, what I want to now render are our tabs. So as already said, we will have two forms and one. And for that, we need our tabs. So let me get right here my tabs. This is imported from the components. And please make sure that you import everything from the components and not from Redix UI. If you import right here tabs on Redix UI, you will get like webpack errors. You don't want that. So please make sure that everything is imported from the components. It's very important. So let's now import that. Let me open that. And then in the tabs, the first thing which we'll have is our card content. So let me right here get my card content from the components. Let's open that. Let me give my card content for now. Actually, no, let me don't give it any styling. Let me first of all show you how it looks like. And in the card content, I want to render our tabs list. So this tabs list will be there to render our two tab trigger. So let me right here get a tabs trigger. Let's import that right here from components. All right, and now in this tabs trigger, let's just say this will be the trigger for talk to sales. Now, as you currently see, this component complains. And the reason for that is that we are missing one property. And this property is our value property. So let me give right here this tabs trigger a value. And for the value, this will be sales. Um, this is just the value with which we can identify this tabs trigger. Then let me copy paste this tabs trigger. And for the second value, instead of saying talk to sales, let me just say support. And for the value, I will also say support. If you now save that and again go back, you now have these triggers which don't look very good, let's be honest. So how can we fix that right here? Well, it's quite simple. For this tabs list, we have to give it a class name. So let's say class name. And now we have to tell it right here what layout we have right here. So this is a layout with two columns because we have two tabs trigger. So let's say right here grid and then let's say grid of columns two. Let's save that. Let's again go back. And now we have right here these two tabs. Now, as you see, the styling currently does not look as it should. And the reason for that is that we have to give right here our tabs a default value. So let's say default value. And this right here will be, let's say, sales. If you now save that and again go back and do a hard refresh, you now see that talk to sales is the first value which is selected. Now, as you also see, the styling currently does not look as it should. And the reason for that is quite simple. We have to go to our globals.css file. Right here, we have all of these CSS variables, as you already know. But what we also right here have is this body class, this add media class, and this root. What I want you to do is delete this body. We don't need that. Then you have this add media, delete that. We don't need that. And delete this colon root. Let's delete that. And also right here with this add layer utilities, you can also delete that. All we need right here is these add tailwind classes, this add layer base with our CSS variables, and then also at the bottom, this add layer base, again for shards in UI. If you now save that and again go back, you now see our tabs look already way better. And that's exactly what I wanted. But now let's be honest, does this right here look good? 
I don't think so. We are missing a bit of margin to the top. So what you have to do is go to the card content and give it a class name. And right here, let's just say margin top of five. If you can save that and go back, you see, yes, this looks already way better and we can now leave it like that. Also, you see if I, for example, tap inside of here, this is as already said, this accessibility, which is very cool. Now, one thing which you also see right here is that our H1 does not have any spacing to the card component. This is not what I want. So let's give this H1 right here a margin bottom and this will be of seven. Let's save that, let's go back and now this looks very good. So we have now created our card component with our tabs trigger and what we can do now is create our tab content. So let me again go back to VS Code and what I want you to do now is go underneath the tabs list but still in the card content and inside of here we will create a tabs content. It's very important that you import that from your components. Let's open that and we have to now uh, right here pass a property because as you see right now tabs content complains and that's because we are missing the value property so we have to tell right here this tabs content to what tabs trigger it belongs to so this tabs content belongs to the sales trigger so for the value this will be sales then let's continue with our tabs content let me right here create a p tag and i will just say you want to integrate your product with us question mark so right here question mark we can help you dot please contact us down below let's save that let's again go back you now see we have this p tag it looks quite good nevertheless i think we can style it a bit better so let's give this p tag a class name and let's right here just say text of muted which will be foreground and text of small if you now again save that and go back, you now see, okay, this looks good. We can leave it like that. So we have now our P tag. And now the next thing which I want to do is create our form finally. So let me again go back to VS Code. Let's go underneath the P tag. And inside of here, we can now create our first form element. Now for the action, let me for now delete it. We don't have a action, quite simply. And inside of this form, we can now create our inputs. So let me first of all create a diff. This will be the parent of our label and input. And let me give this diff quite simply a class name. And this will be grid. And then let's also do a space Y. And this will be of one. Then inside of this diff, I can now render a label. This is imported from our components. And inside of here, this will be the label of name. So right here, we will input our name. Then underneath the label, let me render our input. This is imported from our components. This is self-closing. And for the input, let me just give it for now a placeholder. And we will just say John Doe. If you now save this and again go back, you now see right here, okay, we now have a label and then we have the input. This looks quite good. Nevertheless, one thing which we currently have right here is that we don't have any spacing to the P tag not quite what we want. So let's again go back and what we have to do is style our form element. So for this form, let me give it a class name and in the form, so the children in the form, right here will be all aligned vertically. So we will create a flex column layout. So let's say flex, flex of column, and let's say gap Y of four to have a bit of spacing between the items. And let me also say margin top of five. If you now save this and again go back, you see, okay, we now have some spacing and this looks very good. So since we're now done with the, our first diff element, or in other words, with our first input, let's now create our second input. So let me right here create another diff element. So underneath the first diff, let's create a second diff. Then let's again give it a class name. This will be of grid and space Y of one. And then in this diff, let me again get our label. For the label, I will just say email. And then underneath the label, let me get a input. Let's import that. This is self-closing. And let's say placeholder. And for the placeholder, I will just say john.do at example.com. Let's save that. Let's again go back. And now we have the first input and the second input. Okay, this looks good. Now the third thing which I want to render is our text area. So let me again go back. Let me go underneath this diff. Let's create another diff element. And for this diff, let me get a class name. For the class name, this will be again grid and then space Y of one. And then in this diff, let me get my label component. Let's import that. Let me right here just say 
question or problem because we don't really know what they have. And then for the label or underneath the label, let me render my text area. This is now imported from my components. This is self-closing. And for the text area, let me get a placeholder and let me just say, please share uh, some details about your needs, dot, dot, dot. I think this should be fine, yeah. Let's again go back and now we have the input, we have the email and we have right here our text area. Now I think the text area could be a bit bigger from the height. So let me give this text area a class name and let's say height of, yeah, I think 32 probably. Yeah, that's about 128 pixels. This should be good. And yes, this is now a bit bigger and I think this looks a bit better. So you see, I can also make it smaller if I want to, but I think the default height of 32 is good. And the last thing which I want to do now is render our submit button. So still in the form, but below the diff. And inside of here, let me just get my button component from our components. And let me just say submit. Let's save that. Let's again go back. And now you see our form looks beautiful. We have our tabs right here. As you see, I can click on them. Then we have our input, our second input. We have our text area and we have the submit button. This looks great. Now there's maybe one thing which I want to change and that's the theme as I already mentioned. Currently we have like this black or sync theme. I'm not really sure what it is, but if I go back to Shards in UI, as already said, you can go right here on the top two themes and we can update it to our liking. Now, normally I always choose blue, but for this video, I will choose or select violet. So now instead of having a black color, we have this violet color, which looks very good. So what I can do right now is click on copy code. This will open a new model and let me click on copy. Then let's go back to our project and what I have to open right here is my globals.css file. Uh, inside of here, as you see, we have these CSS variables as already said, and the nice thing with them is that you can customize them. And that's exactly what we do right here. We change our CSS variables. So what you can do is delete this at layer base, just the top one, leave this at layer base with the border border right here, it's still needed. Delete right here this with the CSS variables and paste what you have just copied. So now we again have our new CSS variables and if you can go back to the project, you now see the color has updated to this violet color. So the button is now violet instead of black. This is very, very cool in my opinion, but what you'll also see is if I now try to submit this form, nothing will happen. Now, first of all, let me show you this accessibility. If I now click on tab right here, you see that. Okay, this is very cool. If I again click on tab, you now see, okay, we are now in the form. If I again click on tab, we now have our input. I can type something. I can again click on tab. Then we have our second input. I can now click again tab and now we have our text area. So this is accessibility in action. Very, very cool in my opinion. And at the end of the day, you should always try to create something like that. Because if you didn't know, a lot of people on the web have issues, uh, not issues in a bad sense, but issues in that way that they can, for example, use the mouse or something like that. And in that sense, accessibility is very, very important. Okay, and this is now very cool, but now we have to also fix our second form. Because if you currently open that, you see we don't have any content, not really what we want. So let me can go back to VS Code. Let me close the globals file. We don't need that. And let me go underneath this tabs content. So we are still in the cut content, but now we are underneath the tabs content. Let me now create a second tabs content. And inside of here, we have to again pass a value because as you already know, Shards in UI has to know to what trigger it belongs. So right here, our trigger, we gave it a value of support. So let me copy that and let's give it right here a value and this value will be support. Then in the tabs content, we can again render a P tag instead of just doing it manually, we can just copy this p tag because the styling is already created. We can paste it inside of here. And the only thing we have to do is right here, change the content. So instead of saying you want to integrate your product, blah, 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 we can just say troubleshoot. I hope I'm not misspelling this right here. Um, troubleshoot a technical issue or payment problem. 
something like that. Again, write whatever you want, it does not make any difference. If you now go back and click on support, you now see, okay, we now have a P tag and this is again very cool. And since we now have right here our P tag, we can now also create our form. So let me go back, let's go underneath the P tag, let's create a form element, then let me delete the action, we don't have one right now, and then for this form, let me also get a class name, and this will be again a column layout, so flex column, which means let's do flex, flex of column, gap y of four, and margin top of five. Then inside of this form, let me render a diff, and this will be again the parent of the two inputs, or not of the two inputs, but of the label and the input. So let me right here inside of this diff get our label component, let's say name, and then underneath the label, let me get a input, and then for the input, this is self-closing, and let me give it again right here just a placeholder, and let's say John Doe. Then for the diff, let me also get a class name, and this right here will be just grid, so let's say class name of grid, and space y of one. Now, if you didn't know, uh, grid and flex column is actually the same thing, because at the end of the day, either you have a grid with one column or your flex with one column. So grid is just shorter to write than if you would write flex and then flex column. But the end result is the same. You have one column, which is vertically stacked. So if you want to, you could say right here flex and flex column, or you could say grid. It does not make any difference. The end result is completely the same. Some people prefer flex, some people prefer grid. I use both to be honest with you. So now we have done that, let's save that, let's again go back and now you see right here we now have the name and the input. So the next thing which I want to do is now also create our input for the email. So let me again copy this or not copy it but create a new div element underneath this div. Let's again give it right here a class name and this will be grid and then space y of 1. Then inside of this div, let me get my label, let's open that, and inside of here, let me just say not name, but email. Then inside of this label or underneath the label, let me get my input, this is self-closing, and then for this input, let me get a placeholder, and for the placeholder, I will just say john.do at example.com. Again, if you save that and go back, you now see we have an input for the name, and we also have a input for the email. This looks quite cool, let's continue. Let's create another div element. This will now be for our text area. So let's create a div. Let's give this div right here a class name. And for the class name, this will be again grid and space y of one. Inside of here, let's get a label. Let me just say problem. And then underneath the label, let me get my text area. This is already imported, this is self-closing. And for the text area, let's again give it a placeholder first of all. Let's say, what is wrong? Let's say it like that, what is wrong? Question mark. And then underneath the text area or in the text area, let me also get a class name. And let's again say height of 32. If you now save that and again go back, you now see well, the form looks kind of the same to the talk to sales form, doesn't it? It looks one to one. But there's one more thing which I want to integrate right here, and that's a input to upload a file. So let me again go back and then underneath this div, let's create another div element. And this div right here will be again class name. So let's right here create a class name. Let's again do a grid and a space y of one. And inside of here, let's create a label. For the label, let me just say asset, and then underneath the label, let me get a input. This is self-closing, and then for this input, I want to now allow the user to upload a file. So we can give it a type, because this input has a type, and for the type, it will just be file. Then let's save that, let's again go back, and now you see we have a input for the name, a input for the email, a input or a text area for the problem, and we also have a input for our asset. This looks quite cool. And the last thing which we have to do right here is again render our submit button. So let me go back and then right here in the form, but underneath the div, let's again get a button and let me just say submit. Let's again save that, let's go back. And now you see this looks also very good. So as you now see, we have two forms. Again, you can just use right here your 
keyboard, so you can just go to the left or right, and that's how you can toggle right here the screen. So one section or one form is there to have like a talk to sales contact section, and the other form is there to ask the support for some question because you have some problem. So the user can right here type the problem, but he can also upload the asset or a asset or a picture, in other words, of the problem. All right, my friends, so I now think it's time to make our form submission work because currently if you click on submit, you see we do a loading state. So as you see on the top left, our fav icon spins, but nothing happens. The reason for that is because we're currently doing a get request, but this is not what we want to do. We want to do a post request and we want to transmit right here this message or this support, whatever you want to call it, this form, we want to submit it and we want to get the information. So if the user fills out this form, I want to know what his name is, I want to know what his email is, I want to know his problem, I want to get a notification that a user wants to talk to sales. And to do that, we will have to use a headless form API to make all of this work. And to make this work, to use this headless form API, we will use getform. And let me simplify getform as good as I can. So at the end of the day, getform is a headless form back and for your website, web app, whatever you want to call it. And it allows you to collect form submissions. So at the end of the day, what we have right here, this is our form submission. We can collect that. We can receive email notifications so that we know that somebody has submitted our form. And the nice thing is also that GetForm right here offers a lot of integrations. So everything from Zapier, Slack, and whatever you need. Now Zapier is probably the most or the biggest one, the most general one with which you can do the most. Nevertheless, it's very cool that they offer a lot of integrations. Also one cool thing which they offer is spam protection. So for example, in the past, I had a website with a public contact us form and I had a problem that I got a lot of spam. So somebody tried to tamper with my website, which means he sent like 100 requests, which means at the end of the day, I had to pay for all of these requests, even though they weren't real requests. With GetForm, you don't have this problem because they protect you from spam, which is very, very cool. We can also look at the features even further. So what they offer is also, for example, auto response and auto response is cool because this means whenever the user does a form submission to your website, you will get a notification, but the user who also did the request, the submission will also get a notification or a email, which will say, Hey, we got your email. We will respond in one or two days. You can customize it however you want. That's very, very cool. You can also set up your your custom email server. Nevertheless, for this demo, we don't have to do that because the server which GetForm offers is great and it performs well enough. Uh, email notifications, I already talked about that. Custom email templates. This is something very cool. You can customize it as you want. We can also export all of the entries which we get. We can also use an API, redirects, webhooks, and more cool things. So how does GetForm at the end of the day really work with our website? So what we'll get is a form API and we can do with this form API whatever we want. We can either paste it right here inside of this form. So you see you can just pass a action with this URL and then the form submission will already work. Or what you could do is, what we'll do in this video, is create a server action, do a bit of server validation, and then submit all your data from there. So you wouldn't really paste it right here in your form, but you would do it through a server action. And again, this is very, very cool. So now I think it's time to test it out. So you see right here, this is how the dashboard looks like. And again, it's very cool because you can see everything, manage everything. And also one thing which I haven't mentioned right here, which I forgot, even though it's very cool, you can upload files. So right here you can see you can upload files. And that's also what we'll do because if you go to our support form, right here we can upload assets. And later on, we can then see these assets in the dashboard. Again, very, very cool and not easy to build by yourself. So it's great that this service right here exists. Also, maybe one thing which we'll have to mention is the pricing because pricing is always very important. They offer a very generous free tier with 25 submissions. So you can do 25 submissions completely for free, no credit card, no nothing, just 
log in and get started. So now I think it's time to get started. So right here at the top, let me go to account. This will now redirect me. If you don't have an account, please sign up with, I don't know, Google, your email, whatever you want. But since I am or, or since I already have an account, I got now redirected to the dashboard. And this is how your dashboard will look like. Currently, we don't have anything. So what we have to do is go right here to the left corner and create a new form, a new form endpoint. So let me click on create. And then inside of here, we want to now create a form, not a folder, but a form. Then for the form endpoint name, let me just say, uh, what do we have right here? We have our talk to sales. So let me just say right here, talk to sales. Then the next step is to select your time zone. Please right here select the time zone in which you are. For me, this will be right here Berlin, but if this is for you, I don't know, Madrid or Malta, then please select the correct one. Okay, so I've now talked to sales and I've also selected the time zone and now I can click on create. So now we right here have our talk to sales dashboard, let's call it like that. And what we also have right here is our form endpoint. So this is the URL which we can use to make form submissions work. So for now, what I'll do is copy this. So let me just copy this URL. Let's go back and let me go to the top form. So right here for the form, which is the talk to sales form. What we'll do for now, we'll change that in a second, but what we'll do for now is give it a action of this URL. So let's paste it inside of here. So get form.io slash the ID of my endpoint. And now we can test out if it works. To do that, let me first of all give this input right here a name. For the name, this will be name. So right here, input name. Then let's give this input for the email also a name. And this will be our email. Then for the text area, let me also give it a name. For the name, I will just say um, message. And then that should be already all. For the button, we can just give it a type. This will be of submit. And in theory, this should now work. What do you think? Should we test it out? I think we should. So let me go back. What I'll do right now is do a hard refresh to make sure that everything runs. And then let's first of all create a name. Let me say Jan Marshall. For the email, let me say Jan at my email. And let's say, hey, how are you? And then let me now click on submit. And huh, this is not correct. We got redirected to get form. So I probably did a mistake. So let's go back. So for the form, I think I forgot the method. So let's write here paste a method and this will be of post. Again, we don't want to do a get request, but we want to do a post request because at the end of the day, we want to do like a mutation if you want to call it like that. So let's again go back and let me click on submit. All right, friends, so what do you see? We got redirected and it says right here, thank you, the form was submitted successfully. Great. Now, if you open your phone or your Gmail client, whatever you use, you will probably see right here. I will try to show it to you. I'm not sure if you see it, but I got a notification right here, which says, hey, we got the form submission request, blah, 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 which is very, very cool. So we see that submissions work beautifully. And what we can do now is go to our dashboard and get form. As you now see, we have right here one notification. If I do now a hard refresh, you will see right here that we now have one form submission. So you see the name, you see the email, you see the message, and you see also the date. So you see I did this request or the submission three minutes ago, and that's very, very cool. Now, what you can also do, for example, is open the logs and inside of here, you see at this time we got or we sent a email notification to my email because the submission was successful. Again, as I showed you in my phone, um, we got this notification. Now, as already said, we can now also implement a auto respond feature so that the user who made the submission also gets an email which says, hey, we got your message. For that, it's again, relatively simple. What you have to do right here is in the top, you have these four buttons. What I want you to do is click right here on automation. And inside of here, we can now automate it however we want to. What I want to do, as already said, I want to send a autoresponder email. So right here, let me add this um, action. Then you see reply to the email, which did the um, right here submission. Then reply to, this is my email, the subject, yeah, this is fine. And for the message right here, we can just say, thank you for your or submission. We will come back to you in 
two to three days, something like that. And again, you can write right here whatever you want. This is your autoresponder email, so you can also change the subject and whatever you need. But for now, I think this is good enough for us. So what I can do now is click on complete. So now you see this is how our automation looks like. First of all, when our endpoint receives a new submission, we redirect the user to this thank you page. We then send a email notification to us that we got right here a submission. And then we send a autoresponder email to the user who did right here this request or this submission. Now, as you see, I have to also save this. Currently it says unsaved changes. So let me click right here on save. And now this looks good. What do you think? Should we now test out if this autorespond works? I think we should. So let me again go back to our localhost 3000 page and let's see if it works. So let me do it right here a hard refresh for the name, let's say Jan. Marshall for the email, I will use a temporary email. Then let's also do right here for the question or problem. Let me just say, um, hey, thanks for this form. And let me click on submit. Now, as you see, we will get redirected. It again says, thank you. I will get a notification right here in a second on my phone. And what you will also see is right here, I got this notification again. And if you now go to this temporary email, which already, as I mentioned, I, I've created, you will see that we now got right here this message and it says, thank you for your submission. We will come back to you in two or three days. So as you now see, I as the owner of this website, if this makes sense, get a notification on my phone, so on my private email, but also the user who creates the submission also gets right here a auto respond. This is very, very good. And now I also want to show you how the message looks like, which I get, because I've only shown you that I get a notification, but of course I also get the content. So first of all, we see what endpoint this is. So this is the talk to sales endpoint. You see when it was submitted, so the date and the time, you see the name, Jan Marshall, you see the email, and you see the message. At the bottom, you will also see the country and the URL. I won't show it to you because I don't want to leak anything. But again, this is what you'll see, and this is very, very good. So let's now close that. This is all good. We see that this automation works beautifully, which is great. And if you go also to the dashboard, you now see we have an inbox of two requests or two submissions, again, with the name, email, message, and the date, which is very, very cool. Now, also one thing which I mentioned right here is if you go to the top and click on settings, you will see that you can also add right here a honeypot field name. Now, if you have never heard about it, let me right here explain it to you. So by adding a invisible field to your forms that only spam bots can see, you can trick them into revealing that they are spam bots and not actual end users. So add the following input into your form. As you see, this input is of type hidden, which means the user does not see it. But if a bot tries to reach your website, he will just select this input. And when he selects that, we will know that this is a bot and spam. So what you can do is copy this input. We can again go back. Then for this form, I can just paste it above this diff. And with that, you see we're currently getting an error. That's because I have to add right here a slash and I can also close the style. We don't need that. And now we have right here created this input. And with that, we are now sure that only users submit this form. If a bot comes, he will toggle this input, which means we won't make any request because we will know that this is not a real human, but a bot. So now we have done that. Let me copy also this input for the second form because I want to also protect it right here. And now I think we are done with that. So what should we do now? We have now learned that our submission works. We have now created all of the autorespond feature, the notification feature. I think what we should do now is integrate this form in our server action because currently we do it right here through the form, but this is not very safe because I want to do server validation. So to do that, we will use a server action. Let me open my Explorer. Let's go in the app folder and inside of here, let's create a actions.ts file. This actions.ts file will be there to store our server action who would have thought, and right here, we will also do our server validation. Now, since this is a server action, the first thing I have to do is mark this as use server, so that this right here runs on the server. 
Then let's now create our server action. So let's do an export async function. This will be called talk. So let me spell it correctly. Talk to sales action. Then let's invoke it and let's open that. So now we can use this server action right here to connect it to get form. To do that, it's relatively simple. What we have to do is a constant response and then this will be equal to await fetch. Now inside of this fetch, I have to pass the URL of the endpoint. So if you again open your page.tsx, in the form, we have already pasted right here this URL. So what we can do is copy this URL and what we'll do right now is create a new environment variable. So we will store both of these action URLs inside of our environment variables just to make sure that nothing is leaked to the client. Even though it's okay to leak to the client, I just want to make sure. So let me create a new file right here in the root directory, not in the app folder, but in the root directory, let's do dot env and then inside of here, let me create a talk to underscore sales underscore uh, URL. And then this will be equal to this URL. Let me also stringify it and paste it inside of here. So now we have created a dot env file with our environment variable and now it lives right here. This means we can now use this environment variable talk to sales URL inside of our action file. So let's do a process, so process lowercase dot env dot right here talk to sales URL. Right here you currently see the TypeScript complaints and that's because right here it does not know if this environment variable is defined. So a TypeScript trick to help with that is to add a exclamation mark at the end and now right here TypeScript knows that this environment variable is defined. Then another thing which I want to do right here is also add the method. So let's add a comma, open an object, let's paste our method. Then for the method, as you already know, this will be post. So this is uppercase P-O-S-T. And what we have to do also is add our form data. Now currently we don't get any form data. So in the params, you can get your form data, again, lower case, and this will be of type form data. I can now pass this form data to right here, this response. So let's right here get our body and this body will be equal to our form data. So what we did right here is just create a standard post request. We passed the URL of our API and we passed our form data as or to our body. So this should be now in theory everything and I think we should test it out. So what we can do right now is copy this talk to sales action name, so the server action name. We can go to our page.tsx. I can delete the method. I can delete this action. Let me create a new action. And as in value, let me import the talk to sales action. This is imported from the actions file. Let's import that. Let's save that. And let's see if that works. So let me do right here a hard refresh. Let's say Jan Marshall. Then let's say test at test.com and let me just write some description, some message. Let me click on submit and let's see if something happens. So you see now we didn't get redirected. That's because we do everything from the server action. But if you heard that, I got on my phone again a notification. This means if I go to my dashboard right here, so let's go to the get form dashboard. Let's go right here to talk to sales. Do you now see we have a inbox of free submissions and this is, has been created one minute ago. So we see this again works beautifully and that's very, very cool. Now, what I want to do is if the user has created right here a submission and if it was successful, I want to redirect the user to a success page. So let's create, first of all, for that, a new success page. So let's go in the app folder. Inside of here, let me create a success page. Let's create a page.tsx. And now inside of here, we can create a nice looking success page. So since this is a route, let me do right here a export default function. Let's just call it success route. Then let's invoke it and let's open that. Let me now create a return statement. And then in the return statement, let me create right here a section element. In this section or for this section, let me create a class name. And I want you again center everything in the middle. So let's say height of screen, so 100 viewport height, width of screen, flex, then flex of column and items of center 
and justify of center. Again, with this section, we just center everything in the middle and that's all we do right here. Then in this section, I can now render our first div element and this div will be the parent of all the children inside of here. So let's give it a class name of flex, flex of column, since I want to have a column layout. Then let's do an items of center, a justify of center, again to center everything. Then let's create a rounding. So let's do a rounded of, uh, let's say MD. I think this is fine. Let's do a border. Then let me also create right here a border of dashed. This means the border is not solid, but it has like little dots. So dashed again. And let me also create a padding of let's say eight. Let's do a text of center. And let me also do a animate of in. And let's say fade in of let's say 50. So 50 right here, the opacity. Okay, this now looks good. And then in this div, I can now render a icon. So let me render a div. We will need this div in a second. And in this div, let me render the check icon. This is imported from Lucid React. This is self-closing. And then for this check icon, I can give it a class name of size 10. This means width of 10 and height of 10. And I can give it also a color. So let's say text of green 500. Let's now see how that looks like. So let's go back and let me open the slash success route. So inside of here, you now see right here, again, this border, which is dashed. And then we see this check icon. Now I want to get a background color. So let's go to this div and let's add a class name. Let's get flex, let's use size of 20. This means width of 20 and height of 20. Then let's also do an items of center and a justify of center. Then let's do a rounded or full and I want to give it a background color. Now if I say BG of green 500, you will see now we have one green dot. This is not what I want. I want to have opacity of 10%. So let's say slash 10. And if you now save that and go back, you see, cool, this looks very, very good. So let's leave it like that. Let me now also create a title and a small description. So underneath this div, let me just create an H2. And let me just say, success, we got your message, exclamation mark. Then for the H2, let me also give it a class name and let me say margin top of six and text of XL and font of semi bold. If you now save this and again go back, you see, okay, this looks quite presentable, quite good. So what do I want to do also right here? Well, let me also add a description. So underneath the H2, let's get a P tag. And for the P tag, I will just say our team will come back to you shortly. Let's say like that, exclamation mark. And this also looks nice. So if you go back, you now see the title and the description. Now we can give it a class name. So let's say class name of margin top two. Let's say text of center. And let me also say text of small. We can also give it a different color. So we can say text of muted foreground. And if you now save that, you see, yeah, this looks very, very good. The last thing which I want to do is render a button to again go back. So underneath the P tag, we can just render right here a button. This is imported from the components. And then for the button, we can just say go back to home page. Now, if you save this and again go back, you now see, okay, we have the button, but it's too close to the description. This is not what we want. So we can give it a bit of margin to the top or in other words to the bottom. So for the P tag, we can just create a margin bottom of eight. And if you now save that and go back, you now see we have some spacing and this is quite good. Now, currently, if you click on the button, you see nothing happens. Again, not quite what we want. So what we can do is give this button a as child property, and we can wrap this go back to home inside of a link component. This is imported from next slash link. And then let me just paste go back home again inside of there. For the link, I have to pass it an href. And for the href, this is just an empty slash. On other words, the home page. If you now again go back and hover over this button, you see on the bottom left corner that it redirects to localhost 3000. If I click on this button, you see we get redirected. So great, this works beautifully. This works how we want it to. And now we have to redirect the user to this route if he created a successful submission. So for that, let me again go back to our actions file. So inside of here. And what we have to do right here is an if check. 
And for the if check, it's relatively simple. So we have to do a if, and we have to say if the response is not okay, so exclamation mark and then response dot okay. If it's not okay, if it was not successful, then I will open that and just throw a new error. So let's say throw a new error, and let's say something went wrong. But if everything was successful, I want to redirect the user to the success route. So let me just do a return redirect. Now it's very important that you import redirect from next slash navigation. If you import that from next slash distribution, you will get a lot of errors and you don't want that. So please import it from next slash navigation. Let's import that, let's invoke it. And for the route, this will be just slash success. And now this should work. Do you think we should test it out? I think so. Let's go back and for the name, let's say Jan Marshall. Let's again, just give it some test email, hello.com. And let's say, hey, um, do we get redirected? Question mark. Then let's submit this. And now we should get redirected to success. And that's exactly what happened. In a second, I will again get a submission. As you see, I just got that. And you will also see if I now go back to the dashboard and do a hard refresh, we now have four submissions and the last submission was a few seconds ago. So we see this works beautifully and that's very, very cool. Now, as you also see, there's now one thing which I don't like. Our submit button does not have any pending state. Not quite what I want. I want to have a pending state which says, hey, uh, please wait or submission, something like that. To do that, it's quite simple with Next.js, thankfully. So what we have to do is create a separate component. So let's go in the app folder. Then inside of here, let's create a components folder. And inside of there, let's create a submit buttons.tsx or a submit button.tsx. So a singular word. And to make this work or to make now this pending state work inside of here, we will have to first of all mark this file as use client because in this file, we will need a hook which relies on the client side or not on the client side, but on a JavaScript bundle. And if you mark a component as use client, you will automatically get a JavaScript bundle, which is what we need right here. So what we can do now is a export function. We will call it submit button. Let's invoke that and then let's open that. Inside of here, I have to now get the pending state. So let's do a constant. I want to destruct chart and this will be equal to use form status. Now it's very, very important that you import use form status and not use form state. Both do completely different things. So please import the correct one. So use form status. Let's import that, let's invoke that. And then right here where we destructure it now, we can get our pending state. And this pending state right here is a Boolean, which means it could be either true or false. This means we can now use the ternary to render the button for each state. So let me right here create a return statement. Let's use empty tags. And then inside of here, let me now do a ternary. And let's say if pending is true, let's use a question mark, let's return something. And if not, let's return something else. So if pending is true, let me return for now just a button component. Again, this is imported from our components. And inside of here, let me just say submitting dot dot dot. But if pending is not true, let me also return a button. Again, let's use our button component. And inside of here, I will just say submit form. Let's save that. And what we can do now is use this component right here inside of our page. So let me copy the name submit button. Let me open my page.tsx. And then instead of rendering right here this button, let me delete the button and let me render right here our submit button component. This is imported from our components and this is self closing. If you now save that and again go back, you see nothing has changed. If I do a hard refresh, the button looks one to one, nothing has changed. So what we'll do right now is style our pending state a bit more because currently it's just saying submitting, but I want to also render an icon. So in front of the submitting text, we can get a loader to icon. This is imported from Lucid React. This is self-closing. And then for the icon, let's get a class name. This will be of size four. This means the width and also the height is of four. And let me also get right here a margin right of two. So a margin to the text. 
And let me also say animate off spin. If you now save that, this should now look good. We could also give our button right here, first of all, also a disabled state. This means the user won't be able to submit the form when it's pending. And let me also give right here a variant and this will just be outline. Then for the button when it's not pending, let's also get a type. And then for the type, this will be just of type submit because with this button, I want to submit the form. So yeah, I think we should now test it out. So let's save that. Let's go back. Let's do a hard refresh. And let's say again, Jan Marshall. Let's say Jan at Jan.com. Let's say, hey, how are you? Does the pending state work? Let's click on submit form. You now see the loading state right here and we got redirected. Great, this is what we wanted. So now we have created a beautiful form. We have made form submission work. We get a autoresponder email and yeah, everything looks good. The only thing which we are now missing, the last thing which we are missing is the validation part. Again, I just got right here my notification, but what we are now missing is the validation both on the server side and also on the client side. Because a lot of people will try to tamper with your form, they will try to submit the form even though that they haven't inputted anything and that's not what you want. That means you want to validate the data on the server side, but also on the client side. And for that, there are a lot of libraries on the market, good and bad ones. But what we'll use in this video is something called Conform. Now Conform is something not new, but let's say it's not that known on the market. Nevertheless, in my years of just using or working in web development, this is, in my opinion, the best library on the market. It's the easiest one, it's the best to implement and probably also the fastest one. Now, Conform works with Zot and Zot is a server-side validation library. Zot is probably the best on the market, it's the most complete and it's the easiest to implement. So we will use Zot plus Conform and we will create a beautiful experience for the user. So let's get started with that. Now let me first really quickly just read through Conform. So right here you see Conform is a type safe form validation library utilizing web fundamentals to progressively enhance HTML forms with full support for server frameworks like Remix or as we use Next.js. Now right here they also mention a few features like progressive enhancement, type safe fields, fine-grained subscriptions and many more features. So I think we should now install everything. So right here in the sidebar we have this tutorial, this is what we need and right here we have a installation command. So we have to install right here conform to react and conform to Zot. So let me copy this installation command. Let's go back to VS Code. Let's open the terminal. Let me stop the dev server. Let me paste it right here. So uh, paste this installation command. This will now install conform. As you see, this was successful. And now I want to also install Zot. So let's do an npm i Zot and this will install Zot. Again, you can also go to Zot dev if you want to learn more and right here they will just tell you that it's a TypeScript first schema validation library and again it's very easy to use and that's why we will use it in this video. So now we have installed conform and also Zot and now we can validate both on the server side and also on the client side. So the first thing we have to do right now is create a Zot schema because the Zot schema at the end of the day is like our single point of truth if you want to call it like that. So right there we will say hey we have an input type of name, we have an email, we have a message and we also have an image which is optional. So for that, let me open my explorer. Then let's go in the app folder. And inside of here, let me just create a Zot schema.ts. So this is the file where we'll store the Zot schema. Let me now, first of all, import Zot. So let's do an import, let's the structure, and this will be Z from Zot. Now we can use this Zot right here, or we can now create, first of all, a schema. So let's do a export constant. We will call it submission schema and this will be equal to that dot object. Let's invoke it, let's open that and inside of here we will now have four fields because if you go to our form right here, so let me go to the home page, uh, let, oh, now the dev server is not running, but if you can remember, we had first of all the input for the name, the input for the email, the text area, and then also the input for the asset or in other words for the image. 
So let me first of all right here create our name because this is our first input and this will be of type z dot string because it's in string. Our input is not a number or I don't know some weird thing, it's a string. And what we can do also is further validation. So we can say, hey, a dot minimum of two. So the minimum length of the name should be two characters. Then let's continue. Let's also add an email. So let's add a comma, then let's say email. And this will be a z dot string. And if I now invoke that, you will probably know, hey, but we don't want to have any string. We want to have an email, a specific email. So at the end, we can do further validation with a dot email. We can now invoke that. So what we have now done right here is told the Zot schema that we have an email, which is of type string, but which is even further validated because we say, hey, it's specifically an email. So not any string, but an email, which right here offers an at, so something at gmail.com. Then the next field which we have is our message. And this will be again a string. So let's use that dot string. Let's invoke that. And let's again do further validation. So let's use dot minimum of two. And let's use dot maximum of yeah, you can say whatever you want. I think 1000 characters should be big enough. But again, you can make it bigger, smaller, however you want. So select the characters as you like, as you feel, as you fancy. Okay, so we have now the three important inputs and the last one which we need is the image. And this is now not a z.string, but a z.instance of, because this is not a string, not a number, but it's in file. So let's invoke that. And inside of here as an argument, we have to pass in file. This is the type, so the type file. And the last thing which I have to tell right here uh, Zot is that the image is not required. So at the end, I can do a dot optional and invoke that. So with that, I now told Zot, hey, the name, the email, and the message are both or all three are required. You have to provide them. But the image is optional. The user does not have to provide an image if he does not want to. So again, that's why we add at the end a dot optional. So now we have the Zot schema and now we can use it in our server action. So what you have to do first of all is go above this constant response, but still in the server action. And inside of here, I want to create a constant submission. And inside of here, what we have to do now is compare our form data against our Zot schema, because the form data has to have the same types as our Zot schema. And if there's some difference, some problem, we will know that there's some issue and we can throw an error. So this will be equal to pass with Zot. Pass with Zot is imported from conform to Zot. This is the helper which we have installed. Then let's invoke it as an argument. Let's pass our form data. Let's add a comma, open object. And inside of here, we have to get our schema. Now this schema will be equal to our submission schema, which we again created in the Zot schema file. So let's import that from there. And as I already said, what we have to do now is say if check. And we have to check that the form data Data compares correctly to the Zot schema. So let me do a if check and let's say if the submission right here, so let's get my submission dot status, if this is not equal, so exclamation mark and two equal signs, if this is not equal to success, then you can open that and we will return right here our submission dot reply. Let's invoke that and now this looks good. So again, let me simplify it. First of all, we right here create our submission. Then we compare our form data against our Zot schema. If they don't compare, if there's some problem, then we right here return the error message to our front end. So this is this return submission.reply. But if the submission or if the form data is correct, then we just create right here the submission with get form. And then at the end, we redirect the user to the success route. So this is all we did. It's very, very simple. But now we have to somehow get the errors in the front end because we want to now also do client side validation. What we have right now, right here, is server side validation. And now we need client side validation. So let me go back to the page.tsx and what we have to do inside of here is somehow get the errors in the front end. Because again, in the actions file, we return right here a submission.reply and we want to get the error message right here in the front end. And for that, we have to use a hook again provided by Next.js or let me correct myself, it's from React. So this is a hook provided by React with which we can get 
statuses or responses from our server action. So right here above the return statement, we can now get the status from our server action. So let's do a constant, let's use these array symbols and I want to get first of all our sales result and I want to also get our sales action. Now what exactly is this? So with the sales result, I mean the error message. So right here, if the user has not inputted something, I will get right here this error message. And the sales action is just a form action. So again, at the end of the day, it's just right here this talk to sales action. Then this right here will be equal to the hook and this hook is uh, called use form state. Use form state is imported from reactor storm and it's very important that you import and write your use form state and not use form status. Again, both do completely different things. Use form status is there to get pending states and use form state is there to get the messages right here from our action file. So let's import that and let's invoke it. Now also one thing, if you use next.js 15, then this hook is called use action state. Again, both do completely the same thing. The only thing which has changed is the name. So they did a name change and that's why it's now called use action state with Next.js 15, but with Next.js 14 and with that React 18, it's called use form state. Now for this use form state, we have to pass two values. So right here in the arguments, first of all, the action, this is the talk to sales action, and then also a initial value, and this initial value is undefined. Now, as you see, we still get an error, and this error is because we have to pass right here for this action, a previous state. So in the params right here, in front of the form data, we can get our previous state, and this is of type any. Now, if you want to learn exactly why you right here pass this, then I will create a video soon on that, but for now you can go to the react.dev documentation, it's very good and it will explain everything in good detail. And now if you again save this and go back, you now see this error right here is gone. Now we have a new error for the action and what we have to do is instead of right here now passing the talk to sales action, we have to pass the sales action. So let's pass it right here and now we don't have any errors anymore. Again, the sales action is right here the same thing, we have to just use it, the sales action, because we want to use the use form state and you have to connect it like that. Okay, so now this is done, this is good. And the next thing which I want to do now is connect conform with this use form state hook because we have to now do also client side validation. And to do that, it's relatively simple. Let's do a constant. Let's use again right here these array symbols. Inside of here, I will get a sales form and I will get sales fields. Then this will be equal to use form. Use form is imported from conform to react. Let's invoke that. Let's open that. And inside of here, we will now get a last result. This will be equal to the sales result. So right here, this one. Let me paste it inside of here. And now I want to also run a on validate callback. So I want to now validate everything on the client side. So let me get my on validate right here callback. Let's invoke it. Let's destruct chat. Let me get my form data. Let's open that and inside of here, let me return pass with sort. This is imported from conform to sort. Let's invoke that. Let's pass our form data. Let's add a comma, open an object. Let's get our schema and let's pass our submission schema. Now, if you look at it, you will probably see that this is exactly the same code as in our server action. So we right here just created a submission, we right here have our pass with sort helper, and then we just compare the form data against our submission schema, so our sort schema. So this is exactly the same code, just that we did it in the actions file on the server side, and now we do it right here on the client side. So now this looks good, and now we have to add two more properties, and this is the should validate. Now, this should validate will be equal to on blur. I will explain it in a second. And then right here, the second property is called should we validate, and this will be equal to on input. 
So this should validate on blur means pretty much that the form is validated when the user moves away from this input, so with the mouse from this input, and should revalidate on input means that the user or the form is validated whenever the user types inside of there. So combining these two things at the end of the day ensures that the initial value of the form and also when the user finishes entering the form is at the end of the day real-time safe so that the user gets live updates. I hope you understand what I mean, but if you think about it, it's not that complicated. So it validates when the user right here goes away and it again revalidates when the user again types inside of there. So I hope this makes sense. So now we have at the end of the day now um, combined conform with right here react. And what we have to do now is somehow validate our fields. So what we have to do is first of all, tell our form that we now use conform. So right here underneath the action, we can first of all give it now an ID. For the ID, this will be our sales form dot ID. Then we will also have a on submit and this on submit will be equal to our sales form dot on submit. And then we'll also have our action, which we already have passed. And the last thing which I want to do is also pass the property, which is the no validate, so that it won't validate on its own, but we'll validate using conform. So now this looks very, very good. And now we have to also connect conform to our inputs. So right here we have the input for our name. So let me give it a name. So let me delete this name first of all. Let me give it a new name. For this name, this will be equal to our sales fields that has you dot name and dot name. Then let me also create a default value and this will be equal to our sales fields. Let's use dot name and let's use dot initial value. Let's now also create a key and for the key this will be our sales fields and this will be dot name dot key. Now this looks very very good. Let's now also do the same for our email. So let me delete the name. Let's create a new name again and this will be equal to our sales fields then dot email and dot name. Then let me also right here get the key and for the key this is our sales fields again. Then let's use dot email and let's use dot key. And the last thing which we have is the default value and this right here will be our sales fields and let's use dot email and let's use dot initial value. Then the last thing which we have is the text area. So let me delete the name. Let's create a new one and this will be equal to our sales fields. Then let's use dot and let's get right here our message and let's use dot name. Then let's get our key and this will be equal to the sales fields. Then let's use dot message and let's get a dot key. And then at the end, let me now also get our default value. And this is equal to our sales fields and then dot message and dot initial value. So now this looks good. And if you now save this, what we have to do is restart our dev server. So let me open my terminal. Let me run npm run dev. And this will again restart right here, uh, my dev server. Okay, what do we see right here? We have a error. No, no. What did I do wrong? It's very, very simple. Right here, the error tells you everything. It says you're importing a component that needs use form state. It only works in a client component, but none of its parents are marked with use client. So what we have to do is mark this file as use client. So at the top, let's mark it as use client. And if I now save this and again go back, you see that everything will work as it should. So I am currently doing a hard refresh. And what do you see? We now have our again our form right here and everything looks as it should. Now there's one thing missing and this is right here our error messages. So what we can do is again go back to our form and let's right here create an error message for our first input which is the name. So above the div or still in the div but underneath the input let's create a p tag and let me right here get my sales fields. Let's use dot right here name and let's get a dot errors. Then let's give this p tag also a class name. And for the class name, this will be of text red 500 and text of small. If you now save this and again go back, you now see it says required. We can now do this also for the other inputs. So let me copy this p tag. Let's go to the email. Let's paste it in this div but underneath the input. And instead of getting our dot name, let's get our dot email. 
Then let me again copy that and let's also paste it right here for the text area. So in the div, but underneath the text area, let's paste that. And instead of dot email, let's get our dot message. Let's now save this. And if you can go back, you now see required, required, required. If you do a hard refresh, you see we don't have any errors and that's because it's currently not validating. But if I go right here to this name, do a input, currently no error. But if I again go outside, you see required. So this is the should validate and the should revalidate. So now we can test it out. So let's say Jan Marshall, then let's say Jan at Jan.com and hey, how are you? Let's test it out. So now submit form, we have a loading state and we should get redirected. And that's what happened. And if I go to the dashboard and do a hard refresh, we will have a new submission right here. So this worked beautifully and this is very cool. Again, right here on my phone, I again got a notification. I'm not sure if you see it, but at least I got a notification. So we see this works beautifully. So in theory, we are now done with our first form. And now we have to just replicate the same thing for the support. Let's do that right now. All right, friends, it's now time to make our second form work. And to do that, we first of all have to go to get form and create a second, a second right here, form endpoint. So right here on the top left side, let's click on create. Then let's give our form right here a name. We will just call it support ticket. I think this is fine. Then for the time zone, again, choose whatever is the correct one for you. For me, it's Berlin, so I will select Berlin. All right, so we now have our endpoint right here, our form endpoint, and now we can use it. So what I'll do right now is just copy it right here. Let's go back to the project. Let's open the .env file, and we already have right here our first URL. Let's now create a second one. This right here will be called support underscore ticket underscore URL. Just use right here uppercase, that's what I always do. I don't know, best practice or not, I just like it like that. And then this will be equal to a string with our form endpoint URL. So now this looks good. And this now means that we can now make it work. So let me go to the actions file. And what we'll do right here is create a new server action. Surprise, surprise. So what I'll do right now is just copy this export async function talk to sales action. I will just copy it. And let me paste it down below again. Again, the same thing. Let's just paste that. Instead of naming this right here talk to sales action, let's call it support ticket action. Previous state and form data looks good. Then right here for the pass with sort helper, this also looks good. Then for this if check, this looks good. The only thing we have to change right here is this fetch call. So instead of passing this talk to sales URL, we want to pass right here our support ticket URL. So let me copy this right here and paste that. Or in other words, let's change it. Let's replace it. So now instead of having the old URL, so right here, this talk to sales URL, we now have our support ticket URL. For the method post is fine, for the body form data is good, then this if check is good. So that's all we need. This looks very, very good. Now, since we have right here updated our environment variables, it's very important that you restart your dev server. So npm run dev to restart it. Let me go to Chrome and also restart it right here. And since we're done with that, I can close the actions file, I can close the env file, and now we have to again initialize the use form state hook, but also use form on the client side. Because again, I want to get the updates, so the result, the status from my server action. So what you can do first of all is copy paste this use form state. I can copy it, paste it down below. Instead of now having a sales result, let's call it support result. Then instead of sales action, this will be our support action. And instead of right here passing the talk to sales action, this will be again, if you open your actions file, this is the support ticket action. So let me copy it and paste it right here. Let's import that from our actions. And now this looks good. So what we have to do now is also do the same thing for um, our use form right here. So what I can do is just copy this use form, paste it again down below. And instead of now naming this right here sales form, this will be our support form. 
instead of sales fields, this will be our support fields. And then right here for the last result, instead of naming it uh, sales result, this will be our support result. Again, we get that right here through the use form state hook. Okay, this looks good. Then for the schema, this is fine. For should validate, this is fine. For should revalidate, this is also fine. And what we have to do now is also pass everything right here to our second form, to the second one. So let's right here start with the form. Let's give it an ID. This right here will be equal to our support form, then dot ID. Then we also right here have a on submit. And this on submit is equal to our support form and then dot on submit. And the last thing which we have right here is our action. And for the action, this is our support action. Let's also pass a no validate property. And now this looks good. So now let's again combine our inputs with conform. So right here, the first input is our name. Let's get a name property. And this will be equal to our support fields. So let me spell this correctly, then dot name, and then dot name, who would have thought. Let's also get in key for the key, this will be our support fields, then dot name, and dot key. And the last thing which we have is our default value. And this will be equal to our support fields, then dot name and dot initial value. Let's now also do the same for the second input for our email. Let's give it a name for the name. This will be again our support fields, then let's do in dot email and dot name. Then let's get in key. Then for the key, as you already know, this is again our support fields then dot um, email and then dot key. And the last thing we have is our default value. And this is again our support fields, then dot email and then at the end dot initial value. So this looks good. Let's now continue with the text area. Again, let's get a name right here. For the name, this will be our support fields, then dot uh, message and then dot name. Let's also get in key. And for this key, as you know, again, this is right here, our support fields, then let's do in dot message, and let's do in dot key. And then the last value is our default value, which is again, our support fields, then dot message and dot um, initial value. And now let's do the same also for our last input. So right here for the file upload, let's again, give it a name for the name, this will be again, our support fields, then dot and now this will be right here image and dot name. Then let's also give it right here where do we have the key for the key. This will be again our support fields, then dot image and dot key. And now this is already all we don't have to add right here a default value. And the last thing which we have to do is update this button because currently it's just a standard submit button, but I want to have my submit button with the pending state. So let me get my submit button component. Let's get that. This is self closing. And if I now save this and again, go back, let me go to my website. Let me do a hard refresh. You see, yeah, nothing has changed. Everything looks beautifully. Now, what is one thing which we have to add right here? Well, this is again, our error messages because currently we don't display them. So what we can do is again, go right here to our form. Let's go to the first div with the input for the name. Let's create a P tag. So let's get the P tag. And I want to again, get my support fields. Then let's get the dot name and dot errors. Let's also get a class name. And this is again, text of red 500 and text of small. Then let me copy this P tag. Let's paste it right here for the email. So right here inside of this div, but underneath the input. And instead of support fields dot name, this will be dot email. Then let me again copy this. Let's continue to the text area. Let's paste it underneath the text area. And instead of dot email, it will be dot message. Let me again copy the P tag. Let me go right here to the asset. Let's again paste it right here. And instead of dot message, it will be dot image. All right, what do you think? Should we test it out? Let's save that. Let's go back. And now you see required, required, required. Great. So let's test it out. Let's see if that works. Let me do a hard refresh. I think 
everything has been added. I'm not sure, but I think so. So let's go to the support field. Let's say Jan Marshall. Let's say Jan at Jan.com. Let's say, hey, how are you? And let me upload one image. All right, let's click on submit form. Da -da -dum. We have a loading state and we should get redirected. And that's what happened. Great success. We got your message again. On my phone right here, I got a notification that we got a form submission. And let me open again Gmail and show it to you. So right here, you see we have a new submission with the endpoint support ticket, not any more sales, but support. We have the name of the user, we have the email, we have the message and the attachment. I can open this right here. It will open a new tab. And this is my image, which I've uploaded. So as we see, this works beautifully. This is exactly what we wanted. And if I do a hard refresh in the dashboard from GetForm, you also see it right here. Again, we have the name, we have the email, we have the message, we have the date, and we have again this file right here on the right side. I can click on that and then it's downloaded. Guys, we are finished with this video here. I'm drinking my water because whew, I think this video is one hour long or so, but you have learned a lot. You have learned how to create a beautiful contact form as you see right here. You have learned how to make a technically viable contact form, which means we have done server-side validation and client-side validation. You have learned how to protect it against spam with the honeypot input, which is hidden. This means if a spam bot comes in, he will click on this input, which means this form won't be submitted, which is again very, very cool. Then what else have we done? We have created a pending state. We have again implemented get form, a headless submission API or a headless form API, which makes submissions very, very easy. You see on my phone, you always get right here this um, notification that a new submission has come in. You saw how the emails look like. You saw how easy it is to automate everything, implement everything. And just in general, I think it was a good video. You are now one of the people who know how to really build a good form. Because believe it or not, most people on the internet don't know how to build good forms, how to build secure forms, but also how to build nice looking forms. So it's definitely a good skill which you have learned today. And thank you GetForm for making this video possible. It's a great service. I have been using it already for years. I've been using it privately before they even reached out to sponsor a video. So yeah, thanks everyone for watching this video. Check out GetForm in the description down below. It's a great service. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to maybe consider becoming a channel member to get access to more videos, but also to get access to videos before they are released to the general public. And now I hope you enjoy your day. I hope I can see you in the next video. And now, bye.